Great. Thank you, Maria. And wonderful job to all of our speakers so far this morning uh, and to Maria for navigating us through that. I hope you've enjoyed hearing some of the really latest and greatest research we're funding. We're very excited about a lot of these projects, so I hope that you share that enthusiasm with us. Thank you for joining us for the second annual Dairy Summits. We are all busy and we appreciate the time that you're dedicating to this. Whether you're sitting at a computer and watching and listening or whether you're tuning into this uh, with just audio, we hope you get a lot out of this. So as I was introduced this morning, I'm Heather White. I'm faculty at UW-Madison and serving as the faculty director for the Dairy Innovation Hub. Before we move on into the next session, I just want to do a few housekeeping things here. As you can tell, we are not taking breaks on our end. That's to keep it flowing for you and to keep lots of great new information coming. But remember, you're in listen-only mode. Have a snack, eat some lunch. While you're at it, eat some lunch for Maria and I. Uh, and feel free to jump in and out as some of the sessions may be a little bit more relevant to you or maybe more of interest or as you squeeze us into your busy days. Also, remember that these sessions are recorded, and I'll, I'll tell you later how to get back to those. So if you have any questions for these speakers or the speakers in the rest of the afternoon, remember to toss those into the chat feature of your media player, player and we'll uh, take those questions as we go through. And if we don't get to them all, we'll be sure to send you a response. We have your email addresses. Also, one last thing, even more than the speakers that are featured today, we have 30 research posters uploaded onto uh, your portal there. At the top, you should see a tab or an option for posters. And you can look at those uh, posters and see even more research. Some of that is further along in its stages and will be featured tomorrow at the symposium. So now it's my great pleasure to introduce you to some of our new hub-funded faculty. Hiring faculty has been a concerted effort over the last two years. And this one hour session will showcase several new faculty that are settling in across the three campuses. We're excited to give them an opportunity to showcase for you what they've done uh, as they just start to get established. Since the hub started about two years ago, we've had 11 faculty searches. Each of the searches involves a significant time commitment from each campus multiple departments across the college and committee members. In academia, a person builds a career long research program that contributes to the teaching of undergraduate and graduate students and to building a research program that's well posed to answer those critical questions as they approach to bring in external funding, whether it's from industry or federal sources. And so these are really long term commitments. Our goal is to hire faculty that want to stay in Wisconsin for their whole career. And so these processes are lengthy and focus heavily on fit and the ability to build one of those programs. Again, the hub embarked on 11 such faculty searches across UW-Madison, Platteville, and River Falls. And out of that, we actually hired 12 faculty, six of whom we're featuring today. So we hope that you will enjoy hearing a little bit about them. Again, send your questions our way. Uh, but without any further ado, I'd like to introduce Grace Lewis at UW River Falls and have her kick us off here. Thank you for the introduction, Heather. So as I was introduced, thank you again. Um, my name is Grace Lewis. I earned my PhD from Penn State University. Um, and today I'm gonna be talking about some of the research I did at Penn State and then how I hope it will translate to the University of Wisconsin River Falls. I'm very excited to be here. Yep. So starting with some of the previous research. Um, so I worked with the system called a high pressure jet in contrast to maybe some of the high pressure technologies you've heard of, including high hydrostatic pressure and high pressure homogenization. The high pressure jet involves feeding a liquid sample pictured on the left into an oscillating hydraulic pump, which maintains a pressure of up to 600 megapascals. For reference, 600 megapascals is about six times the deepest part of the ocean. Um, commercial homogenization is at 15 megapascals, so much higher pressures. It maintains that pressure up through until it reaches a restriction nozzle, which is shown in that like, blue rectangle on the top right of that image. At this restriction nozzle, which in our case was a diamond nozzle, the flow is restricted so severely that what comes out is at about Mach 4, incredibly high velocities. So actually, if you were to stick your arm under this nozzle, it would cut your arm off, but we didn't do that. 
We collected the sample into a heat exchanger, cooling the sample immediately and we, until we collected our high-pressure jet-treated sample out. So we processed a variety of dairy products through the high-pressure jet, and the proposed mechanism was consistent across all dairy products that in, as probably most of you know, if not everybody watching, in dairy products, the primary protein um, is uh, casein micelle. So this casein micelle is a spherical protein quaternary structure that with a high pressure jet treatment of about 400 megapascals, it breaks down into subunits or smaller proteins. And the idea was that as it breaks down, it's releasing some more functional proteins from the core of the micelle. And the, these proteins then function in a variety of dairy, dairy products in a variety of ways. So I'm going to talk about two of the dairy products today, but we worked with many other dairy products, including skim milk powder, ice cream, just all the best dairy products out there. So if you could click ahead, one. Yep. So on the top here, we made a cappuccino. Um, so we use skim milk, either not high pressure jet treated, the control, or 500 megapascal treated. Um, so skim milk, coffee, sugar, and water. And we froth the cappuccino and pictured at zero hours. This is immediately after frothing. And you can see that maybe there's a slightly higher foam head in the 500 megapascal treated sample. But through four hours of storage, you can see that there's still a foam head in the 500 megapascal treated sample, but not in the control. So again, what's happening through the high pressure jet is you're breaking down this casein micelle. The casein micelle, um, the, the separated proteins, the more functional proteins, then help to stabilize the, the foam interface and allow for a more stable foam. If you could click ahead. Yep, so we also use the high pressure jet in a chocolate milk. So chocolate milk normally has carrageenan in it. It's a stabilizer that helps to stabilize cocoa and chocolate milk. Um, but on the left, you have a control chocolate milk with no carrageenan. And you can see that through a 14-day shelf life, the cocoa sediments out. Versus in a 500 megapascal treated chocolate milk, the cocoa remains stable through 14 days without the addition of carrageenan. So this is a very clean label product. Both of these products are very clean label many applications for these products. So if you could click to the next slide, thank you. Um, so now talking about, we don't have the high pressure jet at UW River Falls, so what do I plan to do at the University of Wisconsin River Falls? So first, I still plan to work primarily with the casein micelle because I think they're super cool. Um, so again, finding ways to disassemble the casein micelle, which if you click one ahead, can be done through a variety of ways, so including high pressure, so I actually have a high pressure homogenizer coming to my lab, as well as alcohol, things like ethanol, a processing age such as emulsifying salts, as well as combining a variety of temperatures and homogenization conditions, you can break down the casein micelle and you can incorporate a variety of compounds, including, you could click ahead one, Heather, including polyphenols, medicines, vitamins, specifically hydrophobic or fat soluble vitamins such as vitamin D. And then you can kind of reform, not exactly the casein micelle, but you can re-aggregate these proteins in a variety of ways. So let's say we used ethanol to break down the casein micelle. You can then evaporate the ethanol out, and you can reform a protein structure. So of course, there are a variety of purposes for this. So if you could encapsulate, let's say, vitamin D, you'll increase its stability against heat, against light. You'll also increase its absorption in the digestive tract. And that can be for animals. That can be for humans. And you can also fortify a lot of food products, either with um, polyphenols or other healthful compounds, as well as make colorants more stable. So, of course, many, many applications for this, um, and I'm very, very excited to get started. Um, so with that, I would love to take any questions at the end. I will turn it over to Dr. Joe Sanford from uw Platteville. Thank you, Grace. Uh, hello, my name is Joe Sanford, um, and I am a system professor in the School of Ag in the Soil and Crop Science Department at uw Platteville. Um, I was one of the first hires to the Dairy Innovation Hub back in August of 2020. So I've been here a little bit longer than some of the other people that are on this round table today. Um, but I was hired as an agricultural and biological systems engineer uh, to focus on agricultural and wastewater management problems at Wisconsin dairy facilities. Um, so what I want to do today for the brief time I have you is just kind of introduce kind of the focus of my research program and kind of some of the things I've been up to this past year. Um, so the overall goal of my research program is to essentially just develop practical methods to address a lot of the environmental problems that are associated with agricultural waste products at Wisconsin Dairy Industries. And this includes investigating new ways to manage manure, um, such as 
you know, get new technologies for manure application, new manure processing technologies, um, addressing concerns with on-farm runoff, such as runoff from silage bunkers, feedlots, and also trying to address some of the rising concerns with emerging contaminants uh, Wisconsin dairy facilities, such as PFAS. Um, so the program that I've been developing here at UW Platteville, um, a lot of my research so far has revolved around um, biochar, uh, which is due to the fact that when I was at UW Madison doing my graduate degrees, um, a lot of my research there was investigating uses of biochar at agricultural facilities, and I'm kind of continuing that into my position here at UW Platteville. Um, for those of you who may not know what biochar is, it's a carbon-rich product. Uh, that's a product from the energy process called pyrolysis. And what it produces is a very carbon-rich char um, that has a lot of interesting chemical characteristics, allowing it to be pretty good at retaining nutrients in the soil and being a great soil amendment to sequester carbon and improve soil quality. And so a lot of the products I have going on revolve around using biochar in some way or another. One project that I have going on uh, in collaboration with UW-Madison through the Dairy Hub is looking at using pyrolysis to densify manure nutrients to make a manure-derived biochar product. Um, that picture in the center on the top, uh, what we're looking at here is basically taking a manure solid uh, product that we've reduced the mass, the volume of this product, but maybe it's still a little too heavy to easily transport it for long distances from the farm. So what we've been investigating is looking at taking that product going through this paralysis process to reduce the mass. Um, the figure there on the right kind of shows the mass reduction going through biochar, biochar production, reduce the mass by about 80%. And the huge benefit of this is that we retain pretty much all the phosphorus in it. And so now we have a phosphorus rich product, which we can easily transport um, <clears throat> to areas that need that phosphorus. Other research projects I have going on, uh, looking at using uh, biochar as a soil amendment, particularly in agricultural farmstead runoff treatment in vegetative treatment areas, so amending it to vegetative treatment areas, um, looking at different types of biochar to amend to it, different rates and application depths um, in order to help reduce some of the nitrate pollution concerns from these systems. Um, we've also been looking at, through the Dairy Innovation Hub, using biochars as a manure storage cover um, to reduce greenhouse gas emissions and odorous emissions from manure storages. Um, and recently, we've also started a project looking at dosing biochar into livestock anaerobic digestion systems to increase um, or biogas production and also biogas quality by reducing hydrogen sulfide production. You can go to the next slide. <laughs> there we go. Oh, back one. <laughs> Um, one project that I'm really excited about, uh, a lot of stakeholders in the region are really excited about as well, is an ongoing project through the Dairy Innovation Hub as well, which is assessing manure nutrient prediction technologies to improve nutrient application um, from manure applications. Um, essentially what we're doing, it's a collaborative team at UW Platteville and UW Madison. Uh, and actually this research really started at UW River Falls, so it's kind of touched all of the Dairy Innovation Hub um, universities. Um, but essentially what we're doing is looking at how we can incorporate some of these new technologies such as near-infrared spectroscopy, NMR technologies to basically read manure nutrients in real time to improve the application of manure nutrients to agricultural fields and improve planning and reporting of nutrients in terms of uh, nutrient management planning. Uh, this project has been funded through the Dairy Hub, and we also recently just received notice that uh, we have received continued funding through the USDA CARE program to keep this research going um, for the next two years. Um, through my time at UW Platteville, uh, research, I've been developing my research team. Currently, I have six undergraduate researchers here at UW Platteville. Um, I have one collaborative graduate student at UW Madison and a collaborative postdoc. Um, and I've also been very active in uh, pursuing external grant fundings and currently working on a non land grant capacity building grant to bring some biochar. Um, production equipment to UW Platteville for the Dairy Innovation Hub universities and also um, UW, U universities within researchers for researchers within the um, UW system. And so with that, I will pass it on to Kate Krutzinger. 
Thanks, Joe. And I'm super impressed you got the last name right. Um, I am so pleased to be here at the Dairy Innovation Hub Summit. Um, as you can see, I chose to go slideless as compared to some of my other colleagues, which now feels very brave, but I was hoping it would be a bit more conversational and less like a presentation. Um, as Joe mentioned, I am Kate Kreutzinger. I'm an assistant professor of dairy cattle welfare and behavior at UW River Falls. I recently started my position at River Falls in August, but am really looking forward to building a dairy welfare and behavior research group. And overall, um, the goal of my research and my appointment is to ensure a good quality of life for dairy cows and calves who are under our care. And I just want to say one of the things that really drew me to this position was getting to work with the Dairy Innovation Hub. I think the opportunity for Dairy Innovation Hub-centered research and faculty members within the animal health and welfare pillars really highlights Wisconsin's commitment to um, improving and safeguarding the welfare of dairy cows in the largest dairy producing state in the U.S. Um, my current work is specifically focused on a couple of areas in dairy welfare. The first is a continuation of my PhD research, which seeks to understand transition cow management practices from the cow's perspective. And the second is looking at surplus or male dairy calves who then go on to become veal and dairy beef. So my PhD research focused on creating low stress calving or maternity pens for dairy cows. And the interesting thing that we found was that dairy cows retain a lot of the natural maternal behaviors that we would see on pasture, despite being in what we would consider a safe and comfortable environment. And I think when we look at the transition period, it's a clear area of challenge as we see high rates of disease, which is why so much work has been dedicated to improving nutrition and understanding epidemiology during this time. However, where I think we have an area of opportunity and what I'm hoping to explore with my research going forward is creating environments that fit the needs of dairy cows during that vulner vulnerable period from immediately after calving to the few weeks after giving birth. And one of the best places to start, in my opinion, is by understanding what a cow looks for in her environment after giving birth. And once we understand her needs, we can target some of those more specific stressors associated with the post-calving transition period, such as regrouping, pen changes, and removal of the calf after birth. And then the other area of research that I'm currently interested in is getting a better understanding of male dairy calves. Um, there has, there's a large population of male and dairy beef cross calves that aren't retained on the dairy herd for replacements, but instead are sold to be raised as meat. In addition to some of those purebred male calves, recently we've seen a substantial increase in the use of beef semen to crossbreed cows for dairy beef. Um, and I think Archimedes from River Falls talked about that a little bit. But one of the things is that the well-being of these calves really isn't understood. And as the dairy industry continues to progress in social sustainability, we need a concerted effort to understand um, veal and dairy beef calves' welfare in a comprehensive way from the dairy farm through livestock auctions and all the way through to calf raisers. Um, I have to say within my position as a dairy welfare and behavior scientist at UW River Falls and in the Dairy Innovation Hub group, I feel incredibly fortunate to be working with an organization that values the importance of dairy welfare and continues to show their commitment through animal health and welfare pillar. Um, overall, I think the support of improving dairy welfare will help the dairy industry remain sustainable going forward. And with that, I will pass it over to my colleague from River Falls, Luis. Thank you very much, Katie. I'm uh, Luis Peña Levano, and I would like to mention that in my case, I did my PhD at Purdue University in 2017. Then I became faculty of the University of Florida during three years and before moving to Maryland to become assistant professor at the University of Maryland Eastern Shore in which I had a research and extension appointment in regional economic development. 
just to give a little emphasis on my previous research related to livestock and dairy, um, I have studied in two different sections uh, these sectors. In terms of global economic analysis, I have um, made uh, use of a, what is called a computable general equilibrium model to evaluate the climate change impacts on food security and agriculture, emphasizing the role of climate change on the impacts of prices, specifically for dairy and meat sector. This paper actually won uh, the best paper published in the Environmental and Resource Economics Journal in 2020. In terms of a national policies, I have um, published last year a study in regards to the impact of the, of the pandemic on the labor issues regarding to the agricultural farms, specifically in the dairy and the livestock farms, and what were the challenges that these um, businesses has to overcome during last year and what has been expecting to happen during the next year. With that said, the goal of my current research is on the dairy production and climate change with emphasis on regional economics. Specifically, I have been working in three different projects right now. The first one is in relation to the, what were, what is the difference in expectation regarding the situation of the dairy farms five, uh, comparing five years ago and right now, and how that has been changing due to the pandemic issues, and what are the outcomes in terms of expectation of investment. At the same time, we are evaluating, we are expecting to evaluate that uh, using different surveys uh, with the help and support of the Survey Research Center of the University of Wisconsin River Falls. The second um, research that we are also um, studying at the moment is what are the impacts or the role of robotic mechanization or mechanization in agricultural farms, spe specifically in the dairy farms of Wisconsin and, and, and Minnesota, and what, how that can substitute the use of labor in the short and the medium term in, in these farms. Finally, the third research that I'm um, right now working on is still on global economic analysis, and specifically what are the roles of the climate change, specifically on the dairy and the ruminant sector, but with emphasis on what could be the differences in terms of prices and land distribution due to these impacts and how this could have an effect on the U.S. dairy farms. If anybody has any questions, uh, please, at the end of, the, of this presentation, I will be more than happy to answer it. And with that, I will leave uh, this topic to our next presenter, um, Dr. Shifan Wan, my colleague from the University of Wisconsin, Platte. So, thanks, Luis, and uh, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Ifan Wan from UW Platteville. I joined UW Platteville this August, and just want to share with you the research I would like to develop here at uh, UW Platteville. Um, so, there are two um, major areas about my research. Well, first, I would like to share with you about a novel non-thermal technology called plasma. Uh, which I have worked uh, extensively during my uh, PhD study at Iowa State University. What? At Iowa State University. As shown here, cold plasma utilizes um, high voltage to create excited uh, reactive gas species, which can be used for microbial inactivation and chemical reactions. Well, for my research, I would like to utilize an in-package uh, plasma treatment for perishable and heat-sensitive dairy products, such as fresh cheeses, um, for the inactivation of pathogen, as well as the control of uh, storage microorganisms, such as molds um, in shredded mozzarella cheeses. 
Well, this in-package um, treatment would prevent the entry of post-packaging and manufacturing contaminations, which would further ensure the safety of the final products. And this process is fairly quick and with minimal influent, and there is no toxic, toxic residual known. It has a low energy consumption and operation cost. It can be used for both solids and liquid food. And more importantly, it is a single and scalable industrial uh, process can be, can be feeding to the current industrial settings. Well, besides the microbial inactivation, I'm also very interested in the chemical reaction induced by the cold plasma treatment. More specifically, I have a special interest in the utilization of plasma activated water. Well, during the plasma treatment, by the incorporation of reactive, reactive species into the liquid phase, the activated water can be generated and has demonstrated a great potential to be used as um, cleaning solution to wash the fresh produced, leaving reduced background microflora or pathogens, such as like their study done for strawberry or the other produces washing step. And it can also be used uh, as a sanitizer to clean the equipment surface. It has shown that it's demonstrated a comparable or even enhanced effect to the commercial sanitizer for the cleaning of processing equipment. The utilization of the activated plasma acti activated water would potentially reduce the use of the commercial sanitizers, which might have some um, environmental concerns such as the chlorine-based sanitizers. Well, in addition to that, cold plasma treatment could also be used to degrade chemicals, those hazardous chemicals in the aqueous waste streams. So a potential use for um, wastewater treatment as well. So that summarized the first section of my research uh, interest and now to the second part of my research interest. And this uh, is a continuation of my postdoc research. And it's on the focus, the focus is on the utilization of dairy waste materials and byproducts for extraction of value added components and modification of ingredients for enhanced and novel functionalities. Well, for example, one of my previous work has used dairy beta stream, which is rich in milk fat globule membranes. And we did extraction to get a dairy lecithin and bioactive uh, membrane proteins out of that product. And this could potentially increase the uh, value of this underutilized byproduct and reduce the waste. So I would like to continue on this route to develop a scalable method to extract those value added components from the dairy uh, byproducts. And more importantly, to utilize those uh, derived um, agents for products development and in food applications. Well, Besides the extraction part, I would also like to work on using green chemical modifications to enhance the functionality of the dairy ingredients or even bring some novel functionalities uh, to the dairy ingredients. For instance, um, dairy proteins um, might be used to produce anti-freezing peptides or peptide-based agents, like green chemical modification, enzymatic hydrolysis, could be explored under this uh, subject, like addition of octanol saxon OSA or those um, OSA modification for starch, like those applications can be used. If we can successfully modify such uh, ingredients to create a dairy-based anti-freezing ingredients, we can potentially use it to allow the frozen storage of the non-freezable dairy, dairy products, such as cream cheese, to extend the shelf life and the storage of those products. And it can also be used to prevent ice recrystallization in the um, frozen products like ice, ice cream, like shown in the picture on the left side here. So like this part of the research, um, the utilization approach could really increase the value of the, value of the uh, underutilized product and bring economic benefit and reduce waste during the dairy processing. 
So this kind of um, give an overview about uh, my research. And with that, I would like to turn it over to Dr. Jean Pierre from UW Madison to talk about his research. Am I on? You are. Go ahead, Joe. Oh, okay, I'm sorry. I couldn't see. Um, so thank you, Zafan. Um, and like Zafan, I joined uh, UW, uh, the system, and, and Madison and the DIH about six weeks ago. So we're uh, in the early stages of getting the lab set up and, and, and planning and getting things going. Um, so my background is more of a biomedical researcher I was trained in nutritional sciences, uh, ex expertise in experimental biology, did a postdoc fellowship in gut physiology, um, microbiome interactions, and um, uh, immune function. Um, and so our lab, uh, previously at the University of Tennessee, uh, had a number of translational models. Uh, we look at diet interactions, um, bariatric surgery, surgical nutrition, um, and inflammatory bowel disease. So uh, why um, the DIH? As a nutritional scientist um, approaching um, dairy, this is a really unique and exciting opportunity, and that's really what drew me uh, to this position and to UW-Madison uh, to join nutritional sciences and explore some of the um, maybe not obvious uses um, uh, of dairy and dairy products in human health. And so if you think beyond uh, the macronutrient compositions of milk and cheese and, and other um, products, fermentated products. Um, there's a lot of these other immune modulatory compounds. <clears throat> Oligosaccharides is one example that are known to shape the microbiome. Um, but milk and, and clostrums and, and transitional milks also contain um, immunoglobulins that are derived from, from the cow. Um, and so these immunoglobulins. We just started in the first six weeks looking at, at some clostrum samples and some milk samples that we were able to get. Um, have a range of, of um, concentrations of these properties. And one of the things that we'd like to do is get a better understanding of what are the conditions um, uh, from the animal that influences the composition and specificity of some of these um, antibodies. How do they shape the microbiome? And applications of this uh, is potentially inflammatory bowel disease where you can target uh, or, or um, bring in uh, milk that contains high levels of antibodies or low levels or good specificity uh, to shape the microbial composition. Other examples uh, in early life, a lot of children, including one of my own, uh, who are critically ill and, and removed from enteral feeds and put onto parenteral feeds and back and forth, establishing um, that early healthy gut microbiome. And so there's a, a litany of different uh, human diseases and situations where the use of milk uh, in the human mammal uh, to support the, the gut health is, is really uh, exciting. Um, another example, uh, Heather or Maria, if you can uh, move forward there, uh, is using different protein sources that are derived from milk. And so our lab models bariatric surgery through um, vertical sleeve gastrectomy. And one of the things that happens uh, with bariatric surgery is there's this rapid uh, set point rearrangement between the gut, the brain, uh, peripheral endocrine system that drives rapid loss of fat, but also leads to rapid uh, and sometimes detrimental loss, loss of lean muscle that makes some of these patients at high risk of sarcopenia. Um, and also there's a, there's a risk about 30% of bariatric surgery patients require a second surgery because they begin to regain weight. And so utilizing um, some of the macronutrient compounds in milk offer a unique um, opportunity to drive satiety and, and alter GI signaling in a way that will optimize, uh, we hypothesize, uh, long-term fat loss while preventing some of the muscle loss that makes some of these patients um, metabolically better off, but then at risk of some of these other comorbidities. And so um, in collaborating with colleagues here at UW-Madison in surgery, gastroenterology, uh, in the departments of animal and dairy sciences, and with our other DIH 
um, campuses. I'm really excited to pursue these and, and related ideas. Um, and I'd also like to acknowledge um, the support of, of the DIH and the stakeholders of the DIH uh, and um, the public for making the hub possible. Because uh, I'm excited to uh, get started on some of these ideas. And uh, with that, I'll introduce Ryan Prowley from UW Platteville. Thank you for that introduction, Joe. Hello, everyone. As it, it was stated, my name is Ryan Prawley, and I am a professor, assistant professor at the University of Wisconsin Platteville. Like Joe, I, Joe Sanford, I started uh, about a year ago, and my specialty is in dairy cow nutrition and management. So today, I want to share a little bit about the uh, higher level vision of my program the core research interests, and feature some projects that I'm working on. So for the overall program vision, the long-term goal is to leverage innovative technology and data on dairy farms to optimize dairy cow nutritional and health status by developing integrated data-driven management tools. Now, that's a lot to take in at once, but I really see this as being opposed of three pieces. And the top left-hand corner there, we have dairy nutrition, uh, investigating what we feed cows, when we feed cows, and how we feed it to cows, with a particular interest in novel feedstuffs and feeding strategies enabled by robotic milking systems. And the top right-hand corner, we have predictive analytics. So using the wealth of data streams that we have on farm to predict cow performance, or forecast uh, different outcomes and use that to make more informed decisions on the dairy operation. And then the final component, which is really the integrative component for the first two uh, core research interests is management. And as I stated before, I have a particular interest in leveraging our brand new Lely A5 units at Pioneer Farm to integrate concepts of dairy nutrition and predictive analytics to do data-driven management strategies. And in our next slide, I'll actually provide an illustrative example of what that might look like. So in the top left-hand corner, we have our cow. And for those of you who might know me, uh, I had a moment of weakness and didn't put a Holstein cow there. But from her, we can see all kinds of different data that we can retrieve. We have DNA, the genomics, activity, rumination, production body weight, producer records kept on dairy comp or PC DART that we can integrate and provide to a prediction equation. And in this example, we have a ketosis risk prediction. And ketosis is a metabolic disorder in early lactation dairy cows. And based on that uh, prediction, we can have a couple assessments that will change how we manage the cow. So in the bottom right-hand corner, we have cows being assessed as low risk. So we might not pay as much attention to her and not do any interventions. But in the top right, we have a cow that is higher risk. So we're probably going to want to intervene. And that can be through a variety of different methods that are based in our nutrition research. And, for example, using the Lely A5, that could be increasing the amount of concentrate or pellet she receives at the robot feeding her a specialized pellet or feedstuff, or even doing a prophylactic propylene glycol administration uh, using a liquid feeder. Now, in pursuing uh, questions like this, uh, I've been pretty fortunate this past year to have a few funded grants and three research publications. And if you're interested in any of my published work, that QR code right there, feel free to uh, print screen that or what have you, and you can use that to look at a uh, list of my published work. I've had a lot of great undergraduate research opportunities, nine so far, and they're going to explode uh, in the next two semesters, it looks like, thanks to Dairy Innovation Hub support. And I've been doing more in terms of outreach, too. My big claim to fame this past month has been uh, participating in PDPW's Dairy Herd Management Workshop. Now, as far as funded research that I would like to feature that's going on at UW Platteville that I'm part of, this morning I talked a little bit about our AMS 
our robotic syst milking system enabled saturated fatty acid research study looking at targeted supplementation to early lactation cows. I am part of another hub funded collaborative project uh, with members of our computer science department here at Platteville doing cybersecurity risk assessments for dairy farms. I have a collaborative project uh, with our MC, Dr. Heather White, where we're looking at developing and validating a blood-based biomarker panel to diagnose or monitor cows with fatty liver syndrome. And I have another project trying to use milk-based informatics to proactively monitor uh, cow manure phosphorus excretion. With that, I'd like to thank you all for your attention. And if you have uh, any interest in discussing research or outreach opportunities, feel free to look me up at uh, UW Platform's website. And now I'll hand the reins back over to Dr. White. Thank you, Ryan, and thank you to all of our speakers. If you'll turn your videos back on, we'll go to uh, a panel discussion here. I think it goes without saying that you are all very uh, – top talented uh, ads to our faculty across the three campuses. So it's personally been really fun for me to get to know all of you and to talk to you about your research programs. Uh, and I look forward to some discussion. So some questions here that are coming in. Um, anybody can jump in here first, but what influence did the Dairy Innovation Hub and Wisconsin's emphasis on maintaining strength of the dairy community have on your interest in the position that you're currently in? I guess I'll, can you see me? I, I can't see uh, myself, so I have to guess whether you can see me. Um, yeah, I'll jump in here. So I'm a native Wisconsinite, <clears throat> and so uh, my whole life, um, drink milk is, you know, uh, front and center growing up in Wisconsin, our family uh, had a dairy farm in Door County. We, my cousin still um, has it that they founded in the 1860s. And so I grew up with this idea of, of agriculture being very important. Um, and then as a nutritional scientist, the opportunity to come back uh, from my previous institution to my home state and really explore, um, you know, the, the uses of dairy uh, to enrich human life and to improve health. Um, was a major motivator. Um, and so I can't thank the, the DIH enough for that opportunity, and I look forward to um, working uh, with all of you. I can piggyback off of Joe's comments a little bit. Um, I am not a, a native Wisconsinite. I'm actually from Ohio. But Wisconsin, in terms of dairy research and being able to work within work with the dairy industry is really meaningful. There are so many cows. In fact, uh, after we first moved here, I'd be driving down the road and on the phone with my husband and I would say, oh, look, another farm. And he'd be like, Kate, we live in Wisconsin. What are you talking about? There are cows everywhere. Um, but in terms of the Dairy Innovation Hub, I, I briefly mentioned it. But as a, a welfare scientist, we see that it's becoming so important to really promote and be proactive about the care that animals receive for the ultimate sustainability of the dairy industry. And so with the four pillars developed by the Dairy Innovation Hub with animal health and welfare being one of those key concepts, um, it's a really exciting opportunity to get to explore some of that more welfare-based work um, in order to really in improve and safeguard the quality of life of for the animals under our care in Wisconsin, of which there are so many, um, and hopefully contribute to the overall social sustainability of the dairy industry. Would anyone else like to jump in on that one? Yeah, I can jump in. So coming from the, the food science perspective, I've always loved studying dairy proteins, dairy foods. Um, it's been my passion. So having or joining, you know, the Dairy Innovation Hub where we want to collaborate, we all want to research the same thing, and not even just in food science, but beyond. So 
I mean, working from the cow to, or actually even from the field to the cow to, you know, the food, um, it was a huge motivator for me, um, people who want to support the, this research and my passion. So that's awesome. Yeah, I just want to echo with Grace, like as food scientists, it's really working on dairy research is kind of the really excited thing when seeing Wisconsin has this uh, program here to work with different um, areas in towards the dairy industry and work closely with the farmers and different uh, industries here. It's been really a privilege to be here. In my case, I, I could like to say that because I'm from Peru, we do not have fresh milk. So usually during at least the first 16 years of my life, I never had a taste of fresh milk. So um, I think that was actually one of my motivations of why I decided to do, uh, to work towards the dairy industry, because it was very fascinating when I was in my uh, undergraduate and I saw this, the milk production itself. And one of the reasons why I really like this position and it's, it's actually two, twofold. The first one is the work environment. I really like to work my, with my colleagues. They are very supportive and I feel that I am growing as a professional. And the second is the, that as an economist, I really like to see the, the implications of the economic studies on the dairy farms. So I, I, I like that instead of being as in the previous cases, which I, I evaluate and the, the situation and see the long-term horizon. In this case, actually, I can see it in an, in an, in an immediate action. Great. It's wonderful to hear from all of you on that. I've heard collaboration come up all day, and I'm sure everyone else has caught that theme through this as well. Could some of you tell us what collaboration, both within your college and across the campuses, has meant for starting your new lab uh, on the campus you're at? I know uh, Ryan and Joe have been at Platteville for a year, so maybe I'll start with you. But for others that are only, you know, a couple months in or even a couple weeks in, be great to hear what kind of jumpstart that's that's helped you get. Yeah, I, I can start. Um, I'd say that I've been pretty collaborative in all my grant writing. I have uh, grants with UW Madison, UW Stevens Point, UW uh, Green Bay, quite a few different, and a couple other system universities as well. And so, you know, coming to Platteville. Um, it's not an R1 school, and so having that collaboration, having that ability to work with Madison researchers and Madison facilities is really, you know, given myself, Ryan, and I'm sure the others at River Falls and Platteville kind of a leg up when pursuing external grants because we, we can get access, we have resources, we have collaborators at Madison where we can get, get some of that equipment um, that otherwise, you know, a small school like Platteville and River Falls may not have. So that's been huge in our, our area, bringing in some external funding uh, to kind of fund some of these research projects that I've been doing. And I think I can echo a lot of Joe's sentiments. Um, both of us have strong connections with UW-Madison, being alums of the programs over there. It has been great uh, being able to have access to resources there, as well as being able to collaborate with great science and doing great science at both of our institutions and being able to secure funding that way. And another great thing about being in the state of Wisconsin is industry support too and having industry collaborators. And I think uh, they recognize the potential that the hub is providing and their support has been wonderful for getting projects off the ground and pursuing new lines of questions, uh, new lines of uh, questioning, reasoning that uh, could have some direct impact on the dairy industry. Yeah, and shout out to local farmers in Platteville. They've been awesome to work with so far. I've gone to a bunch of farms, and usually I come away with a new idea for a research project that I hadn't thought of before. So uh, shout out to them. I'll, I'll chime in real quick. Uh, being here six weeks, um, and also like Joe Sanford, um, I'm normally very collaborative. Our NIH grants are across uh, multiple departments, surgery, medicine, pediatrics. Um, but to jumpstart in the last six weeks, 
uh, one of the strategies has been to, uh, again, align with, um, align with industry to get samples, talked with Heather, uh, and learning more about the resources on campus and in the system uh, to get those, those raw samples or process samples to start bringing into the laboratory and doing some of our um, in vivo and in vitro experimentation and, and um, looking at the immunoqualities of these products and what they, what they may mean uh, in certain disease models. Uh, that's been our strategy. Um, and going forward, um, I'm looking at uh, joining the Department of Surgery as well to work with a couple of the surgeons that do bariatric surgery with the hopes that some of our grant submissions uh, will be in a mixed model of, of um, animal experimentation as well as bringing these products into to humans uh, to validate some of that. Great. Thanks for sharing. Anybody else before I move on to the next question I see here? I mean, I can share quickly that I, I started August 23rd, and I'm sitting in Madison right now, so from River Falls, sitting in Madison right now. But I also came one time before, and then again, I'll go in December. Um, so just the interaction I've had with food science scientists at Madison has been phenomenal. Um, in fact, you heard from Audrey earlier. We, we wrote a grant together and then another one for the National Dairy Council um, through uh, a variety of food scientists at Madison. So um, it's just been wonderful to have just so many people to bounce ideas off of, um, whether if they're food scientists or otherwise. Um, it's, it's just been great. Great. I also want to, if I'm... Go ahead. If I may, I just, I forgot to emphasize also, I've had a lot of great on-campus collaboration here at Platteville. We have a lot of great talent that now we're tapping thanks to the Dairy Innovation Hub. For example, the cybersecurity risk assessment uh, project that I'm doing uh, collaboratively with members of our program here has been phenomenal. Also within the animal and dairy science programs here at Platteville, it's been great having their support in executing research and meeting students, which has been a big thing during the past couple years with COVID and getting our foot in the door that way with student researchers. Great. Speaking of students, that was a great segue, Ryan. We've got a question from one of the graduate students into the chat here. What would you say to the grad students and the postdocs that are listening about going on for faculty positions or going into academia? What words of wisdom do you have to share with them? I'll start because I'm as young as I look. Um, so <laughs> I would say you do know what you're talking about. You know, it, your research is good. You do. You are an expert in a field um, going in, and to just go for it. I mean, no idea is too too big. You can find collaborators. You can find people who who want to work with you and are excited. And you have a lot of energy coming in, so just keep it going. I think in my case, I would advise them to to try to take advantage of any networking experiences. For me, most of my, co my colleagues and collaborators currently for my grants are actually people that I met at the, at the, com at the national conferences, and we have been working uh, for a long time. So I think that that is actually a key um, for success. It's a, it's a different experience. It's very different than being in graduate school. Um, oh, one thing to prepare yourself, prepare to be humbled. I thought PhDs were very humbling. Academia is also very humbling. But you, like Grace mentioned, you bring a lot of energy that's going to excite a lot of people. There are a lot of opportunities out, out there for you. And uh, don't, don't view your uh, inexperience as a barrier. View it as a, a spark of initiative, and you'll get a lot of cool stuff done. Uh, I'll have to say that the biggest uh, skills that I've been flexing lately in trying to improve on are writing. Uh, you're going to do a lot more writing for grants and stuff uh, than you did in your PhD. But that's also kind of the fun bit of writing uh, where you don't have to do the most extensive literature searches, but you can really think of cool, innovative things, and that helps you stay excited and motivated. Great. Anything else? 
For so those just, listening, uh, I'd like you to know this is a game. I watch for their facial expressions and to see if their hand is moving to unmute them to know if we're ready to move on or not. So it's like playing poker. And some of the panelists today have good poker faces. So, Joe, what would you like to add? I just kind of uh, piggyback off what Ryan said. You know, you're going to spend a lot of time writing grants, that's for sure. And in grad school, I would think just take any opportunity your mentor is giving you now to start getting some practice writing grants. I had a great mentor, Dr. Larsa M. Addison, who gave me every opportunity to chime in on things she was writing, gave me the opportunity to write some of my own. And, you know, that's really helped with my success here um, early on starting off. So I would definitely jump on those opportunities. I have, I have one more. Um, if you're going to academia, it's very likely that you're going to be teaching. So while you're in graduate school, I strongly encourage you to get some teaching experience. It is probably one of the most fun things I do on a daily basis. It's also one of the most time consuming, but you, you get a lot of reward engaging with students, you know, setting off those light bulbs in their head and then mentoring them through their academic program and uh, to, their, to their future careers. So great experience. I would like to add something that I have learned um, at least in the last years know your limits in terms of time, in terms of effort. As, econ as economists, we see everything as optimization, so optimize your time. Not working too much actually is, is fruitful. Sometimes, it, depending on how much optimally you can work, you will gain actually from it. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. Yeah, I was about to say the thing Luis just said, like good time management, because you're going to have a lot on your hand once you start your career. So you need to know how to prioritize things and have the least done on the time amount, but minor. So like um, need to do all the things at the same time. So you need to know what's your priority. That's the importance. Great. Wonderful feedback for those listening. I think we have time for one more question. I've got multiple forms, just like Maria did, of questions coming in. Someone's texting me a question. For the farmers, uh, who obviously have my cell phone number, but for the farmers and the cheesemakers out there listening, if they have a brilliant idea or they loved one of your ideas and they want to volunteer, or maybe it's a company that's making a product for human health or has an idea, should they sit on that? Can they reach out to you? What value is that for you? And, uh, you know, is that something you guys are all welcoming? Please reach out. Please, any one of us, all of us, um, send an email. Google us. Do something. We want to hear from you. Text me and I'll pass it on. Absolutely. <laughs> agree with Grace. Um, yeah. One of the really fun things that I get to do is study behavior. And farmers are constantly watching their cows. They're constantly watching their calves and seeing new things. And so if you see a cool thing that you have a question about or if you have a project idea, I am always open to it. Um, we spend a lot of time thinking about animals and probably won't, don't spend as much time with animals as we would like to, whereas farmers really are doing that hard work and, and seeing it as it happens. So. Absolutely. Yeah, I would definitely, you know, yeah, same idea. You know, you guys are on the farms every day dealing with the waste, dealing with the milk. We're not. And so your ideas are usually right. And we can usually make something happen with it. So. Yes, and, and in my case, if any farmer would like, for example, to have a case study from their farm, that they would like to know what they could improve in terms of, um, of economic profitability, please feel more than welcome to, to have any, to, to email me. I would be more than happy to, to, to make those, those analyses with all of you because it's, I think that is one of the most important things that the Dairy Hub has as a goal, uh, to improve the profitability of, of farmers. Wonderful. 
On that note, uh, this is a great place to transition to our next session, which is a farmer panel. So I thank you all one last time uh, for participating today, especially for those of you who joined us this morning and this afternoon. Uh, for those listening, several of those who presented today also have posters or presentations tomorrow at Symposium. So feel free to see the posters on your platform or come to Symposium virtually tomorrow. We're really excited to have all these great new faculty that are only possible given the support from the Dairy Innovation.